Good morning, I'm Gail Christian and this is your Women's Circle and we had a, a few problems this morning and we're getting on a few minutes uh, late and uh, I know, uh, it, I assure you that it's not, a, it's not an ethnic issue. It wasn't because black people are always late. We had technical problems that so we were sure that were caused by a, a white technicians. So today we have two guests that really don't need any introduction. We have one of the best comics of the United States. Karen Williams will be with us this morning, and we're going to talk to Karen about the Ha Ha Institute. And we have Tori Osborne, the LGBT activist who has spent years on social issues. I read Tori Osborne's a resume and got tired just reading it. So I don't know how she's possibly accomplished all of these things. But we're going to start this morning with Karen Williams. Uh, Karen Williams, who is a well-known comic. And if Karen's face will come up, I can stop vamping here. Good morning, Karen. How are you, dear? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. You're looking great. It's really nice seeing Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, yes. Uh, you know, how... I see the musicians are back to work, singers are back, but a comic can't get back to work without an audience. Well, so we've, I've been doing? working. I've been working very hard since the pandemic. I've done over 60 online events. And because I have the Ha Ha Institute and people are really so stressed out and full of anxiety, I've been doing a lot of healing with humor work online. So it's been wonderful. Well, well, that's good. That That's good to hear. Karen, I read that you graduated summa cum laude from uh, college uh, on a on a curriculum that you a major that you developed yourself. That's right. What was right. Little about that? <laughs> well, I I've been a touring comic for thirty years, somewhere there in my forties. In order to help my son out who needed the homeschooling, I went back to school and got the two degrees, my bachelor's and my master's degree. Uh, degrees from Cleveland State University. And at that time, Cleveland State had first college where you could create your own personally designed major. So I created a bachelor's degree in humor and healing. And what kind of courses did you give yourself? Well, I gave myself dance classes for dance and movement, all kinds of theatrical uh, classes, some psychology classes, just uh, women's studies classes, since that's mostly who I deal with. So I put together this curriculum that was approved by the university. I originally wanted it to be in humor therapy, but they were not equipped to handle that therapeutic uh, element. So we went with humor and healing. You know, I am fascinated by the Ha Ha Institute. Let me, let me read this. When I was reading it, it says it's an institute that encourages the fullest activity of human potential through humor and the healing arts. Yes. That's that. I know that you're a Buddhist and it seems that you are combining <laughs> Buddhism with your humor. Tell us about the Institute. Well, it's the International Institute of Humor and Healing Arts. We call it Ha Ha Institute. And I started doing comedy in the early 80s, 81, 82. I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was the burgeoning of GRID and what later became known as AIDS. And so I was asked to not only perform at the conference in Las Vegas at one time, but asked if I could do some type of humor and healing workshop. So I say yes and, because that's my improv background. And I created this workshop and a gentleman came, a tall, beautiful blonde guy, whose partner had just passed away three days prior of AIDS. And he said to me that he thought he would never laugh again. And he laughed so much at the workshop. And that's how I knew I was on to something. So I have gone on to study and uh, write papers and do workshops and seminars through my Ha Ha Institute. And my goal, I'm now in a PhD program at 68 years old at Miami University. I'm in my little 413 square foot apartment uh, where I'm working on a PhD in social gerontology. And I'm so excited. After this, I plan to go to Kona and start a Ha Ha Institute retreat center. That's my goal. Now for the, for the audience can, you know, like for people like myself, can we sign up for workshops or absolutely subscribe or join what, what's the process? Well, the process is I have a website. It's www.hahainstitute.com. And I usually, um, mostly people contract with me. 
I've been getting so much interest, to be honest, Gail, that I did four sets of comedy classes with people uh, and did comedy shows at the end of the six weeks of classes during this pandemic, which was fantastic. I had students in Hawaii and I mean, they were calling from all over the United States, which I would not have been able to do if I wasn't online on Zoom. So what I'm going to do is set up workshops as well because people are expressing interest in coming to the workshop. So I'll be doing that in the spring. Well, well, uh, let me see if I understand how this works. I, you know, I'm all stressed out. I call you up and I say, Karen, I'm very <laughs> depressed. I'm very stressed out. What are you going to do to make me feel better? Well, I'm not a therapist. I actually created a slide presentation to show people, but I'll tell you about it since we're, we're in conversation. What I do is share with people, we have learning objectives in every workshop and the workshops go anywhere from 45 minutes to a half day. It just depends on what people want. I have humor and healing, which mostly uh, I address doctors, nurses, social workers, people in the medical fields. Humor and stress management in the workplace, which the workplace is now at home. People have lots more stress at home, working at home. They've got children, they've got mates. So I talk about how to reduce your stress and anxiety during this time, but also how to uh, be in the workplace and eliminate some of the stresses that already exist in the workplace, such as us and them. Most people go to work, they're the workers, you have the bosses, and there's already this tension that gets created. So I talk about that. I also do a full day uh, workshop. I'm certified by the state of California to work um, in probation with probation officers, police officers, juvenile justice officers on uh, finding joy in diversity. And, you know, a lot of people are not trained to deal with diverse populations. It's really a communication skills type of workshop. So I do such a broad variety of work, Gail. I, I'm not a therapist, so I don't do individual counseling. So if an individual comes to me and says, I'm depressed, what should I do? I will say, find a really great therapist. <laughs> now, is, is this open to everyone, men, women, children? And everyone is welcome at the HaHa ha Institute. That's good. And you've, I understand that you've even got some products that people can buy. Yes, I do. I have a, a bag, uh, just a tote bag that, uh, yes, that says the International Institute of Humor and Healing Arts and T-shirts. You know, the Utney Reader had uh, over 15 years ago had a, an article called, if you want to know the truth, ask a comic. Because if you really look around, Gail, the comics are running late night TV. They're on daytime TV. We're the people that you can come to. And we don't belong to anybody, really. You know, maybe the network could cancel us if we're on TV. But we get to actually share with people um, what we perceive as our truth. And many, many people identify. You know, we haven't talked much about comedy, but, you know, uh, in these times, is it hard to be funny? No, not necessarily. I don't find these times. I mean, part of the reason that I believe I was invited here, it's Black History, History Month. And uh, we know that we have a long history of oppression and inequality. And even here in my PhD program, just this morning, we were talking about how most programs have to deal with what can we do from this moment on? Because to really get at the core of structural ageism, structural racism, structural sexism, we'd have to overhaul the whole United States. You know, that's... <laughs> So what we do is we start from this moment now, and that's a lot of what I teach in my humor and healing, is people who tend to be depressed think too much about the past. And people who tend to be anxious are future trippers. That's me, always thinking about what's next. But the fact is we only have this moment. And if we really learn how to live in this moment, savor this moment, appreciate this moment, we will find ourselves just in better health, better harmony, and better uh, communication with people. Because you know for a fact that if you see somebody you haven't seen for a while and you have a grudge against that person, they're going to see it all over your face. But if you come to that person and you just feel like, you know what, I'm having a really great day. I see this person. It's another human being. I can say hello and keep on my path to my own happiness. Well, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> 
It's it's great seeing you, Karen. I wish you uh, you know all the success with the Ha Ha Institute. It sounds absolutely wonderful. I may even show up in Ha Ha myself. <laughs> I hope so. Come see me when I'm in Kona. You and <laughs> thank you, you so much Lucy. for coming on the show. Thank it's good, you. Good seeing you and the best to you. Thank you so much, Gail. Best to you also. Hi, Tori. I've worked with Tori Osborne. She's amazing. I know she is. I know she is. Uh, <laughs> thank thank you. you. Hi, Tori. Hi, Karen. Hi, Tori. Hi, Tori. Yes. Hi, Tori. Hi, First thing in the morning. Oh my God, you're the best. Wonderful. You look <laughs> fabulous. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see bye you. Bye bye, you uh, good morning, Tori. How are you? Sorry we had that delay and, uh, you know, et cetera. But uh, welcome. You know, uh, as I said, when I saw your resume, I got tired. I said, I need a nap. So I don't know how Tori <laughs> is doing this. Uh, you are, you know, really one of the most interesting people in the LGBT community. I remember seeing you a couple of years ago in Palm Springs at Pride. And and, and I know you don't know this. Uh, when you came into the room, there was this buzz. And I'm saying, well, no, what's going on? And they're like, that's her. That's her. That's, and hey, I think that's pretty, I, I think that's pretty cool. I would love to come into a room, have everyone hunch each other and say, that's her. Uh, you are definitely a, a, an icon. I think that's the word they, uh, they use so, uh, and it's really that just nice. means I'm old. Uh, but yeah, that's right. That's what I. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got to be old to be an icon. Uh, I, you know, I think people identify you almost exclusively uh, in the LGBT community as being an LGBT activist. But when you look back, your work has really been much, much wider than that. And I actually wanted to talk to you a day about the much wider version. But I did have a question about the LGBT community. Last year, things were, you know, as you know, all about Black Lives Matter and all about that struggle for social justice. How did the LGBT community fit in as far as you can tell? What would be your analysis? Were they there? Were they not there? Were they there on some days? Well, my sense of things, which is just really anecdotal, but is that there were a lot of young LGBT folks of all colors and stripes who were who hit the streets with Black Lives Matter in solidarity, white, Asian, Latino, as well as African American. And so I think they were there. Now, I keep harking back to that horrible statistic that like 28% of LGBT white gay men really mostly voted for Trump, uh, whereas 14% had voted for him in 2016. So, you know, like, I think we have to figure some stuff out. But I will say that at least the young people are absolutely committed to justice, to equality, to diversity, to, to kind of the higher vision of this country. And it, it's definitely true. And I think that, you know, when I talk to like my friends, straight and gay, um, about um, racial justice and about structural racism in this country, you know, there's people who've been doing it for a long time, like Karen Bass, who's now in Congress, who I've known for, you know, 35 years and knew back when she was heading up the coalition against police abuse in South LA. Um, but the young generation gives me a lot of hope because they just like totally get it. I mean, it, in the middle of a pandemic, for that many people to hit the streets, I couldn't even, because I'm 70, I mean, I couldn't go to as many demonstrations as I wanted to. I, I like could hear it and 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 watch the, everybody, you know, my entire neighborhood, I live in um, Santa Monica in a kind of mixed income um, neighborhood, and everybody had Black Lives Matter signs out and they were um, doing a carton crayoning on the sidewalks. And I mean, it was, an, it was a surge of solidarity, the likes of which I have really never seen at that level. Well, I'm, I'm going to let you pass Santa Monica off as a mixed income neighborhood now. Mine, <laughs> I live in Ocean Park. Uh, you know, I noticed, I noticed once uh, uh, I, was at a, I was at the center in Palm Springs and I, and I said to my wife, I said, 
You know, looking at the gay community, it's so much different from other civil rights groups. Normally, if you belong to a group and you go to a meeting, everybody's on the same side. There's no issue, everybody's for the, but when you look at the gay community, that diversity of opinions and attitudes, does it keep them from really being able to be called a civil rights organization? Well, I mean, I do think that we have our own struggles uh, and our own kind of path forward. I will say that it has been my experience during the height of AIDS, I watched a cohort of privileged, powerful white gay men kind of become politicized and move toward lesbians and people of color who had always been been sort of, you know, understood the broader reform issues of justice. Um, but I, I mean, I have to say whether it's the number of people who voted for Schwarzenegger uh, in when he ran for governor against Gray Davis, whether it's the um, number of gay men. And I, I mean, it is just anecdotal, but it is my experience that it's white gay men. It's not young people of color. It's not lesbians, certainly not lesbians. Um, and anybody who's really experienced oppression. And I think that um, for a period of time, AIDS sharpened the uh, the reality of discrimination against even those with privilege, with financial uh, or race or skin, white skin privilege, um, as well as gender privilege. So, you know, I just think that these things kind of come and go, but the long arc is very good in this, in our community. Our community, yeah, there's diversity of opinion, but for the most part, you know, we, we vote blue and we are pretty progressive as a whole. Well, that, that's, that's good to hear. That's, that, that's, a, that's, a, good, that's a good message. I want to talk about the Democrats for a minute. I, I, know, I know you're one of them. Uh, when I was reading something on you, it said, uh, we are up against fascism. And I said, oh my God, a Democrat said it. They said the word. Tori Osborne said, we're up against fascism. Now, when I look at the democratic dialogue about what's been going on, what went on in the Capitol and what the Democrats are saying, and then I look at the pictures of what is actually happening, it reminds me of that old joke where the, a man says to his wife, who are you going to believe, uh, me or your lion eyes? So, you know, it seems to me that they, uh, there was an attempt to overthrow the government and the Democrats are saying, we need to all be friends and we need to heal and we need to reconcile. And a whole bunch of people are being charged with trespassing. If I knew you could trespass, I'd have gone up there and tried to overthrow the government if I was going to get 30 days for trespassing. Yeah, it's outrageous. I mean, it's just outrageous. The, the, the white supremacists who carried a Confederate flag for the first time in our nation's capital who, who called the police, you know, the N word constantly all day, who, who, who absolutely desecrated and violated the people's house as they call it. I mean, for so many of them, like I think a judge said, let one of them go on vacation to Mexico. Uh, one of them is getting vegan food in prison. I mean, honest to God, the, the average poor, Black or brown youth is not going to get that kind of treatment. And, you know, it's so, but I, but I have to say that the truth is um, now that we're through this uh, impeachment trial and now that Trump is out of office and the Democrats have the trifecta, the House, the Senate and the White House, uh, albeit, you know, by, we got to make sure that we keep it. I really am optimistic about the future, about the, Stacey Abrams has the playbook for how we turn purple and red states blue for how we turn districts in this, in California. We've got plenty of, you know, right wingers in California and people who don't believe in freedom. They don't believe. And, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting to me is that the Democrats have always been, um, 
the party not of law and order and not the patriotic party, right? I mean, it's sort of like the flag, the, the, the Republicans have wrapped themselves in patriotism and the flag. Well, Donald Trump has shown exactly who the Republicans are. They're the white supremacy, they're the Confederacy, the neo-Confederacy, as a friend of mine calls it. And, you know, I think it's the dying gasp of the Confederacy, the kind of patriarchal Confederacy. I think the future, and the young generation proves it, the future is the is a great, you know, multiracial democracy with much more equal opportunity, at least, if not equality. Um, so I'm optimistic. I, I hope I live to see some of it, but um, you know, I've been fighting a long time for this. It's kind of I'm I'm a little tired and I'm very happy to light the flame of the, the torches of the next folks coming up because I, I really believe that youth are the future uh, on climate change, on racial justice, on LGBT rights, on everything. There, it's like 82%. And if you look at the voting pattern from 20, uh, 2020, 51%, only 51% of white youth, like 18 to, um, uh, I think it goes to 29, but it could be 24. 51% uh, tw of white youth of that age voted for Biden, but 95% of black youth and 90% of Asian and Latino youth. So the future is youth of color with kind of barely white kids hanging in there. Is, is the future perhaps more parties? Is it time for the right wing, the far right wing in the Republican party to split off from the from the Mitt Romney part of the party, and is it time for the progressives in the Democratic Party to dump the old old guard? Would we be able to go further with more parties? Well, I wish I believed that were the case, but my long time kind of study of the two party system and the the socialist and communist parties on the left and in the 20s and 30s, and there have been right-wing parties, and California has the American Independent Party, which right. is the right-wing party, and the Peace and Freedom Party on the left. You know, I mean, they've just never been real contenders. Um, even when the left was strong, the early labor movement, the Socialist Party, Eugene Debs was in jail and he got 100,000 votes, which was a lot. Um, or, um, you know, in 1934, uh, in the middle of the Depression, when um, uh, Upton Sinclair ran for governor of California and on a, as a socialist and an open socialist. But you know, they've never been real contenders. I, I mean, one of the things that I've had to learn, and it's not been happy to learn it, because I was born in Denmark and I'm sort of a social democrat in my core, um, like a socialist light, uh, that, is that this is a conservative country. It doesn't really believe in equality. It believes in equal opportunity at best. And of course, slavery and, you know, the 400 year history of genocide and slavery and imperialism. And, you know, it's kind of like we've had these, this, these, two, this two headed beast really. And one, and we have this aspirational side that is very inspiring the you know that Barack Obama probably articulates the positive uh, vision of America the best, and um, you know Trump is the representative of the worst: the racism, the white supremacy, the misogyny. It's just ugly. The xenophobia, and we have, but we have both. And so I think that what we will end up with. I mean, I we need a center right party. We need a Republican Party. We don't need those right-wing nationalist groups and the militias and stuff. We need to demonize them, which is what's happening, which is why January 6th is a line in the sand. And I give it a lot of credit for making it really clear you're on the side of democracy or you're on the side of autocracy, fascism, call it what you will, find a word that's bad. And, you know, we, and I believe in the goodness of most people. 
Um, yeah, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump, but I really don't believe that. I mean, I believe at least 20 million of them are, you know, for whatever reason, it was Israel, it was their money, or it was something besides the worst uh, that he represents. So I, I, I mean, I have faith that this country will rise again and will, that Stacey Abrams and, her, and that playbook will, and the demography and the, you know, they're just trying to hold on to power. I mean, that's all they care about is the Republican Party is bankrupt. They have no ideas. They have no way to fix the pandemic. They have no way to handle racial justice. They have no plans for the future. So I'm optimistic because the, the Democrats do. And I, and I think it's about democracy versus fascism. Oh, no. Oh, no. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Morning. We're off to we're off to a good start. Thank you so much, Tori. Thank for joining you so much. Us. And, uh, you know, good luck, and I hope to see you again soon. I love the painting behind you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna thank channel you. Leslie Jones. Good painting. I, I, I love those, those I love those books behind you. I was at this gay guy's office interviewing him once and he had all these books behind him, and I focused in on the books. And one of them, and they were all like sex manuals. So I was sitting here watching your books and I was wondering, did you have three or four sex manuals stuck into the- Yeah, uh, it's, mostly, the it's mostly political and spiritual. <laughs> thank you so much. Tori Osborne, welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. All right, Appreciate thank it. you so much. Thank you. Uh, the, that, was, uh, that, was, that was good. That show, this show has been like Vix, you know, it's, it's cleared up my head and I, and I hope it's cleared up your head. And I want to uh, encourage you to uh, go to www.yourwomencircle.com. This show is sponsored by the Women's Circle. It is paid for out of the membership dues of women who belong to this organization. It's an organization for LGBTQ well, women who want to connect and network with each other. Uh, it's, a, it's a great group. We do great things and uh, I belong and all my friends belong and we want uh, you to, uh, uh, to belong too. And uh, let me see, we've got next week is uh, the 22nd. Uh, we've got a, a, a Black History Month special, an hour special uh, with uh, featuring uh, Alexis DeVoe will be on. Uh, Alexis was on our first show and she's going to uh, follow up and continue the conversation on the impact of Audre Lorde on lesbian uh, thought and culture. Uh, she'll be uh, joined by Sakari, uh, the photographer. Or we're going to look at some of her work. It's going to be a wonderful show. Uh, please join us uh, next week for Black History Month. And I'm Gail Christian. And thanks for looking at the show. See you next week.